Okay, so um, what I wanted to talk about today is how do you do um, SDN with uh, multiple BGP AS's. Um, essentially, this this can come into play in a service provider and service provider arena, and you can also um, choose to to do this in data center as well. So let's get started. So essentially, what what are some of the use cases? Well, uh, for for one that we have, we want to virtualize all the uh, equ extraneous equipment in in our in a customer prem. So let's say I want to offer like a firewall or an IDS or UTM uh, type of thing, malware, URL filtering thing. Uh, today, what we do is we roll a truck, right? So we have to go disrupt the customer's uh, experience. We have to install a new piece of gear, make sure it's configured properly cross our fingers that it works when our technician leaves. So what we want to do is virtualize all that so that we can pull it all back to the cloud. Essentially all the customer gets is the access node that, that is required to get them access in the first place. And then everything else is done via a virtual machine. Um, so another, another this is just kind of an offshoot of, of this, is a seamless segmentation of tunneling technology. So think of like, a, VXLAN has about 16 million and change when it comes to, uh, to IDs, uh, unique tunnel IDs. Um, and MPLS, by its nature, can be segmented via uh, IGP. So, Every, for every area in OSPF or every level one in ISIS, you can pretty much reset the, the paradigm when it comes to um, tunneling. So what challenges do we have? So uh, in our network, we, we do uh, multiple BGP ASs. Most providers do this. They, they have an AS for their residential network. They have an AS for their commercial network. Um, some people in, in a data centers choose to do this as well uh, by virtue of every pair of top of rack switches has their own BGPAS, the core has a different one. And uh, so they do this uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, some, some of it troubleshooting, some of it uh, you know, kind of uh, segmenting of, of a route scope. So what, this provides some challenges to to be able to get between ASs. In our case, we have uh, two, two different vendors, one in, in our commercial network, um, and then a second one in our residential network. And we have a difficult time lining up what tunneling protocols you can actually use between the two uh, based on their support and the way they, they're configured. Um, some are more flexible than another, some you know, kind of it's an all or nothing thing. Either you bind to GRE or you bind to MPLS. You can't do both. And we've already extensively deployed MPLS in our, in our network. Uh, so another thing you, you, you kind of get into is uh, another challenge we have is MTU size. Um, we have to work down to the lowest common denominator and oftentimes that is um, an access node. And I think of like a, in the cable world, CMTS, in in the telco world, a, a DSLAM, um, those types of things. Uh, in, the, in the cable world, the CMTS uh, today supports an MTU size of about 1527. So if I want to put anything behind it that does not any sort of tunneling, um, we have to take that into account. Otherwise, the customers um, you know, can't do trivial things like banking and day trading and things of that nature. So what do we care? Um, endpoints are ever increasing. I think uh, we can all accept that VMs are just going to increase more uh, to be able to get more blood out of the stone, i.e. The, the customer. We need to provide more services. And that, that doesn't mean always in the data center. It may mean that we have to put that on the premise, too. Uh, there's some advantages to doing that. Um, you can get, get certain uh, efficiencies out of it, but at the same time, we need the flexibility to pick and choose what we do. So I've listed a few of these. So um, what's some of the, 
the problems we have with, with the increasing size. Well, some technologies don't uh, do, it, it's difficult, there's not an elegant way to stitch between domains. Um, others, there's a, I was thinking of like a containerization, you know, it will just explode as far as the, the amount of containers that, that you, you use and while they kind of group together, um, you, can, you can kind of see that, that this is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, IoT, I put that on there. I'm, I'm not really sure what that means for us, but I think we could probably put it on the, the uh, list of things that we need to do and, and to make sure we get in the game of it. Um, at the end of the day, we need to be able to operationally scale this without a whole lot of effort and a whole lot of rethink. So we need to be able to slice and dice uh, tunneling domains at, at will. I need to be able to simply just say, okay, well, this, this tunneling domain is getting too big. I just need to chop it up and, and make it uh, two parts. And I want to be able to do that without really having to do a whole lot of rethink other than just do the work to make it happen. Uh, obviously, another consideration is, is um, I'm sure everyone's kind of in this boat of, you know, multi-vendor is just a reality. We all, we all have either legacy things or, um, you know, we choose to have multiple vendors to keep uh, all the vendors honest. I think you know, pretty much everybody does this. Um, and just a little uh, blurb about MTU implications. Um, so VXLAN costs about 54 bytes uh, extra on, on MTU. MPLS costs about eight. Uh, that's a little, little bit variable. Essentially, um, the eight is what, is what an endpoint is. So you need a, a VPN label and then you need a, a service label on top of it. Um, for, for transit points, there, there's more that, that comes with that as they have to have bypass labels and, and such. And if you get into things that are even more complicated, like carrier of carrier, that, that increases the label stack. But in general, for endpoints, it's eight. So again, as I, as I mentioned before, VXLAN, it scales about 16 million, and then you have to figure out how to, how to stitch together. Uh, MPLS, based on the, its nature of being able to scale, based on the IGP, that a local IGP that it's it ran on, can scale infinitely. It, it doesn't really require um, any particular set of IDs. It can, be, it can be ran ad nauseum over and over again. So let's take a look at uh, what we have as far as options for um, in the case of having multiple BGP ASs uh, as, as we do with, between our commercial and our residential network. So uh, the first option is layer three VPN option A. Um, this is kind of popular with the, with the telcos when you want to do a carrier of carrier type of thing. So essentially what you do is you configure back-to-back -back L3 VPNs. Uh, they don't know about each other other than that they know that they're trading routes between, between the L3 VPNs and you attain uh, connectivity that way. So some pros to this are, again, it's the typical method that, that carriers allow other carriers to get across their network. Cons are this is this is uh, operationally intensive, and you know even if you have a provisioning system, uh, you know there's challenges of you got to figure out uh, coordinate VLANs. You got to you have to kind of uh, capacity planning of this is kind of a bear. You got to figure this out, and and then you have to implement implement rate shaping and, and things of that nature on it. Um, the transit provider, whoever has to always participate in the control plane. This is kind of important, uh, you know, if you think in the context of, say, Contrail, for example, it's producing a lot of uh, host routes, you know, slash 32. So, you know, you don't necessarily want to participate in a control plane of a, of a VPN that you don't really even care about. Really, all you're trying to do is provide um, B to Y connectivity, and you don't really care what the what the routing of A to Z is. So the next option is layer layer three VPN option B. Option B leverages a BGP labeled unicast, but it still requires that the 
that the uh, the transit provider participate in the in the um, control plane. Uh, essentially, the labeled unicast provides me a label between the two BGP ASs, so that now that I can I can start to lay the groundwork of being able to end-to-end -end label uh, traffic so that I can, I can scale my L3 VPNs without having to care about um, tunnel IDs or, or, and be able to keep my network segmented and not have to think about trying to collapse them because it's easier. Um, there's some pros to this. There's no back-to-back no -back L3 VPNs that, that are required. Um, I can le leverage uh, labeled unicast as a, as a tunneling, end-to-end -end tunneling mechanism. Um, unfortunately, it still requires that the transit provider participate in the control plane. This is, you know, again, not a, not a positive thing when that, that particular uh, intermediary hop has no need for, for those routes. And there's another aspect of this. It, it's, it removes the inability to use a route target address family. If uh, I'm, I'll give you a quick synopsis in case people aren't familiar with it. Essentially, how um, BGP works now is I send you all the routes, and you decide which ones you're going to install. Uh, route, route target address family flips that around. You, you essentially have to announce that, hey, I own these routes, and if you'd like to have them, reply to me, and I will and I will provide you just those routes. So uh, considering that in the case of a carrier, I may have you know, hundreds of thousands of routes from a customer uh, because you know, I just allow them to. That's how their network runs. But I don't necessarily want to see those on my, on my transit router. Uh, I only want to see the, the routes that I actually want, want an L3 VPN to terminate on. So it allows me to terminate it on there and then only get the routes that, that I want to have that are interesting to that, in that particular box. So the, the last option is layer 3 VPN option C. This is a, a pure labeled unicast. The transit, the transit network has no idea what the routes are from from A to Z, they they don't need to. Essentially, it's using labeled labeled unicast to provide a a tunneling uh, label from one domain to another, so that you can jump from one domain to another with and leverage its MPLS uh, labeling mechanisms across the its network and its pure data plane. It doesn't know about control plane at all. Essentially, you set up. Uh, BGP sessions between the two domains that you that are interesting that that want to be able to uh, advertise routes between each other, and they have pairing sessions and and be able and they're capable of advertising routes to each other. And then the transit network is oblivious to it and doesn't know, and it, it is simply just data plane. So positives for this: um, you have multiple options for for label distribution. Uh, you can do BGP labeled unicast for this. Uh, I believe there's also, I can't remember the RFC number, but there's a, a labeled ARP concept, which, is, which seems uh, kind of interesting to me. It allows you to um, leverage, let's see what, uh, so I put down here, this is kind of in, uh, important to me. It, it provides me infinite horizontal and vertical scale. So. I can scale my my edges that have all the all the VPNs that are interesting for customers or for for us to do business, and my transit network is is none the wiser. I don't have to scale the control plane at the at the uh, at the expense of of the of the customer routes. Um, it's a it's a pretty much a more mature technology. I mean, MPLS has been down, been around for a long time. This isn't a you know a very you know good argument, but but it is an an argument. Uh, you know, VXLAN's kind of been kind of a newer thing. Uh, as I mentioned, it's got it's got some scaling problems when it comes to to IDs. Um, as we as I discussed earlier, there's some MTU um, implications to it. So uh, the MTU thing, you're pretty much just down the lowest common denominator. Um, you know, whatever is the lowest MTU you can provide in the path, that's what it has to be. That's it. Any questions?
Thank you for the talk. First of all, I don't fully get why do you call MPLS uh, as being uh, infinitely scalable. Uh, I mean, the MPLS label size is also 24 bits. Uh, do you refer to MPLS service labels being local to the how to say provider age? Certainly, yes. So, ah, okay. yes. So that that's the there's the rub, right? So the the service label is only uh, relevant to that domain. So let's say I have a OSPF area 100, right? So that service label only only matters for that domain, and then labeled unicast provides me a label to get to the other domain, and then that that domain takes care of those service labels. Thank you. You're welcome. So uh, maybe explain a little farther what the what the ASBR does that goes from one domain to another. It actually swaps the both the service and VPN label, for, so it's relevant to that domain. And then at the at the other edge, it does the same action, so that each domain knows what what the labels are for for that domain domain. Uh, yeah, it's it's the outer portion of VXLAN. The VXLAN is kind of a L2 tunneling technology. It's a analysis kind of to like LTTP, um, where there's a in in most uh, SDN controllers I've seen they they leverage MPLS as a identifier for a host underneath. So they're doing uh, MPLS over VXLAN or GRE. Uh, the the issue with with the VXLAN is that you have to have unique IDs, otherwise you don't know um, who's who's it for, right? So um, to be able to where MPLS doesn't have that requirement, you're you're not trying to to say I'm trying to get from host A to Z. You're essentially saying I'm trying to get from B to Y. And then the VPN label identifies who the, the packet actually belongs to. Hi. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I mean, it sounds like there are some benefits with MPLS that I would think the carriers would be interested in pursuing. What do you, what do you think may be the barriers if there are providers out there that that aren't going with option C? Um, I think maybe some of the barriers are, I'm trying to think of, of the best way to, to uh, describe it. It's, maybe it's operational, maybe it's uh, uh, about uh, comfort level. Um, we've all had to solve this in one way or another, having having multiple ASs because pretty much any large provider I've seen has multiple ASs. It's just a, a fact of life, either via intention or acquisition. So they've all had to had to solve this in, in some manner. Um, to me, this is a much more elegant and scalable solution that doesn't require operational uh, overhead continually to maintain it uh, or and or accepting uh, situations where you're uh, having to just say, oh, well, that just is capacity-wise, we just allow this to happen, so. Any other questions? Uh, you might know the answer to this. So uh, when I look at at Contrail, it's MPLS at its core, right? But I'm actually using uh, IP as the transit layer um, and then putting MPLS inside of it and then we rip off the IP and then, uh, you know, back to MPLS and dump it off at the edge, right? Because mm -hmm. uh, the endpoints all speak I Ethernet and IP. Correct. Um, uh, we, we also have an MPLS backbone. Um, and I was wondering if, you, if maybe you've done any integration where, like, you kind of remove some of those middle headers um, like the, of the, so because it's entering from MPLS into MPLS, and really all I need is two stacked MPLS tags. Uh, but now, to the transport network um, in the middle, I still have that additional overhead of, uh, you know, what I 
put on at the beginning, basically, to Correct. do contrail work. Um, is there any integration there that makes any sense that like could collapse that um, and just make it uh, more native? So doing an end-to-end MPLS encapsulation does exactly that. It, it plugs you straight into your, your existing MPLS backbone and allows you to seamlessly uh, move packets around uh, via data plane. It's, it, from the transit uh, router's point of view, it's just swapping labels. It doesn't know any different. There's some other kind of caveats with, with using like a GRE or VXLAN is, well, when I want to leave the overlay, I have to have a gateway that terminates this that, and then I have to let it, let it go somewhere. Um, we've kind of jumped through some hoops to make that work uh, without having to have an external box that, that serves as that gateway. So essentially, um, when you want to leave the overlay, I have to ha either have to hand off uh, so that I can take off the GRE or VXLAN and hand it off to a separate device that can route IP packets. Or uh, in an MPLS way, um, what you can do is you can terminate the L3 VPN for, for internet maybe sooner than when you get to your core and simply just run BGP between the external network and your, and your, uh, and your uh, internet router. So you can actually save money this way. You can collapse the, the functions of them and it's actually, for me at least, it's uh, much easy, easier operationally and, and it scales much, much better than, than the, the alternative. Yeah, you think you nailed it. It's like we, we have this nice MPLS, and then we exit, and then we're back to IP, and then we immediately put it back into MPLS. Mm -hmm. And you're like, there's got to be a better way. Uh, right. To end to end. Yeah. Right. In our case, uh, we we label switch from the edge all the, all the way to our peering routers. So, um, like what you said, with the GRE or VXLAN, we're really just decapsulating it just so I can go switch it again. Awesome. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? So if we have no more questions, we have uh, Edward from Juniper Networks. He's going to uh, do a quick demo on how to deploy Contra in a dev testing environment. So. So, so I'm working in the control business unit, and uh, I'm principally I'm a developer on the config uh, part of control. And here I will just quickly talk to you about uh, a contribution uh, we had on f from the open control community uh, that permit to deploy uh, easily control with uh, on the dev stack environment. I mean, so first of all, I will describe what's uh, dev stack for the person who don't know. Uh, so DevStack, it's an OpenStack uh, side project uh, which permits, uh, which based on uh, a collection of scripts that permit to deploy, to deploy uh, quickly uh, DevStack environment from the master branch to develop or test some uh, features. So it's not a, a production uh, deployment, it's just for developers or testers. Uh, so that scripts, uh, that collection of scripts by default permits to deploy uh, an all-in-one uh, OpenStack environment or there is also an uh, optionally the possibility to to deploy that in multi-node uh, case, which is more and it's less uh, supported actually, but it worked. Uh, so as I said, it's based on the master branch. So as I also said, it's uh, easy to deploy. So for example, in that uh, three lines, 
for if you want to customize your configuration, but uh, by default, you can just clone the dev stack script, the scripts and then run, the, run it. After that, you have uh, on the all-in-one uh, node all the basic OpenStack services running uh, in the screen shell. So you have the code clone on your on that host, so you can easily try to modify the code and restart services you modified and try your modification. So uh, that um, that the collection of scripts is uh, extensible. And that the contribution we had from uh, an, uh, an orange, uh, guy from Orange France Telecom uh, uh, com uh, company, which uh, developed the plugin for also inside of uh, OpenStack, deploying and compile uh, the, ma the master branch of Control, of Open Control. So in in that way, uh, when you run, as I explained before, uh, the DevStack uh, scripts. Uh, at the end, you obtain uh, another screen with all sav control services running, and you also have a clone of all the control code on your uh, on your host. So you can easily also modifying the open control code, then restart the service you modify and try to try your features or your fixing uh, directly. So that script have some limitation for the moment. I mean the control uh, support. So that only runs on. Ubuntu 14.04 uh, and 16.04. Uh, uh, some service missing, some uh, control service, I mean, like the alarming system is not supported actually, but uh, any contribution will be welcome. Uh, and uh, I, I contribute to the support for 16.04, and I had an issue with uh, web UI control services, uh, dependency issue with Node.js uh, libraries that I did not get fixed. So actually, on 16.04, you cannot run the web UI. Uh, other aspect like I would like to, to improve here is uh, perhaps uh, improve the time to to, uh, to start it because as control is written also mostly in C++, uh, there is a long time of compilation uh, part. Uh, so I'm trying to propose some fix to to permit to parallelize the compilation and to earn a lot of time. Like, actually, you need the one hour, one hour and a half to, to compile all of control. Uh, if you have a CPU, if you have a host with uh, around uh, eight uh, virtual CPUs, you can pass to 30 minutes. So, uh, it's a contribution I try to, to push. Uh, and what else? Uh, no, that's all. So I can just show you, but uh, I will. I will don't have the. So I will do like this. Uh, I have uh, one node already running uh, that dev stack. Uh, just to put the mic on the table. So just to log on it. Of oh, yeah. I, okay, thanks. Okay. Okay. Put that in your pocket. Right. Okay, so yeah, I'm, I'm just logged on a, on a VM where I run that script. Um, so since I run, um, just to show you before uh, the in DevStack you have a config file where you can def define, you customize all the, the deployment. So you can decide if you want to run a, a different uh, OpenStack project. And also, uh, is there where you activate plugin uh, you want to, to run? So, for the case of uh, of our um, 
of our uh, of, of uh, Contrail. Uh, so the, the, the config file is named local.conf. And yeah, I, I have some customization uh, option, but if you want to add the Contrail uh, plugin, you just have to add that uh, line, which uh, I can provide you after, because it's very small there. But that the, the repository where we can find the plugin for Contrail. So just by ending that line and run again the stack.sh uh, script, you obtain uh, a first uh, screen where you have all the um, uh, wait here. You have all the, con the open stack services. So for example, if, uh, we can see Keystone uh, APIs, Dense API, Nova services APIs, uh, uh, yes, and uh, the, the Neutron API. And as we run the control uh, plugin, we also have uh, another screen. So we call it uh, Contrail. And here you found all the of the contrary services. So, so I disabled some of them because I, I tried to run uh, only the, the service I'm interested on, on, on and when I develop, develop on, on it, sorry. But uh, you, yours, so, so just to say that here I don't have all control services, but you found the view router, the API, the SVC monitor services, the schema transformer services, the control node services, of course, and collector and analytics. I disabled all the DNS services, uh, QI services, and Web UI services. So that's all. That's what I just to share with you. And uh, if you have any question or if you want, I share my uh, my uh, configuration uh, DevStack configuration file. Uh, don't hesitate to contact me and to ping me. Uh, you can find me on the uh, Slack, uh, Open Control Slack. Uh, that's all.